there is something especially fascinating about transit vehicles that don't have to bring their power generation with them. All thanks to the wonders of electricity. That said, while it's well known that subways often get their power from third rails and streetcars often run from overhead trolley wires, discussions on how we deliver the power to the vehicles that are going to provide us clean urban mobility for centuries to come are far too uncommon. There are so many different ways to power our transit, most notably our rail transit. Now in my videos, I almost always make mention when I'm talking about a rail system of how the electrification works, which maybe feels a little unusual, but I think it's super important because we need to build so much more electrification to help us meet our climate change and mobility goals. But probably more so because unlike electric cars or even electric scooters and bikes, I think the electrification we use on our transit is a stroke of historic genius. So the question is, how does it work? If you enjoy this video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. It really helps. Let's start with trains. There are two main ways of powering trains externally. But it's important to note that even a large portion of modern diesel trains are designed using an electrical architecture with electric motors and actual regenerative brakes that do create electricity and then just transfer it away as heat, which is pretty wasteful. So if you're not carrying dinosaur juice with you, you'll need to get electrical power to your vehicle. And the first way that this can happen is with a third rail. A third rail is exactly what it sounds like. Trains are on tracks made of two rails, and a third rail can be added to provide electrical power. The third rail usually sits off to the side, and it's mounted to the sleepers when you do have sleepers, the same as you would mount regular rails, just up. I should also mention that the third rail will often switch sides of track, depending on things like curves and switches, but also to be spaced out further from passengers at locations such as platforms, where it's possible. Now, third rail is probably most commonly known for being widely used on metro systems, like say the New York subway and the London Underground. Uh, just kidding about that second one, I actually lied. The London Underground is actually pretty unique in that it uses a four rail system instead of just a simple third rail in many places. You see, it does have the regular third rail off to the side that you see on many metro systems, but it also has a center mounted fourth rail, which allows the circuit to be closed. This type of approach is actually more common than you might think. For example, in Vancouver, the original SkyTrain lines also operate using two power rails. And in Paris and Montreal and Santiago, the rubber tired trains you see there also operate using two power rails. That probably makes you wonder, how is the circuit completed if you do just have one power rail? Fortunately, since trains do run on metal rails, one of the running rails can be used for that purpose. Now, you're also probably wondering, how does the train actually connect to the rail? And the answer is generally via a spring or pneumatic shoe, which is pressed up against it. This shoe is usually mounted on the bogies or the wheel sets of the train, and this allows it to slide along the rails as the train moves along. As it turns out though, the third rail and the third rail contact shoe aren't always designed in the same way, as you probably expected. Third rails can come in three main forms, depending on which rail system you're talking about. And that typically has to do with the way that the third rail shoe contacts the third rail. However it contacts it. The most common form of third rail you probably think of is top contact third rail, but there's usually some sort of cover piece, at least in the places where passengers usually are to protect people from stepping on it. There's also such thing as side contact third rail and quite common and popular these days is bottom contact third rail, which is safer than regular top contact third rail because naturally it's harder to hit the bottom of a rail when you're say walking around the tracks and because if you have random debris and garbage on the tracks, it's much less likely to hit the underside of a rail than the top of a rail. Now you might think that such a system is only for subways or metro systems because you couldn't risk having people so close to that third rail, right? Well, as it turns out, a lot of mainline railways in the New York area, as well as in Southern England, actually do use third rail. Now, there are level crossings on these railways, but of course the third rail doesn't actually run across them. Instead, trains use their existing momentum or portions of the train, which are still connected to the third rail as they pass through a crossing, for example, to continue to push the train through so that it doesn't get stuck. Though that actually is possible if you have a really short train and you're going really slowly. Now, people are mostly safe from the third rail because it will end some distance back from say a sidewalk when you have a grade crossing, but it still really isn't ideal. And so you don't really see new systems built that way. Now, in my videos, I suggest that third rail is probably inferior to overhead wire power, but you rarely see overhead wires used on subways, at least in North America. So let's explore this technology and how it works. 
With overhead wire power, wires known as catenary sit directly above the tracks, allowing trains to receive power, using that clothes hanger looking device that's known as a pantograph, which presses up against the wire, providing the train with electricity. Now, the pantograph can actually come in multiple different types of designs, from diamonds, which tend to be more traditional and more modern arm pantographs, all of which though generate pressure to maintain contact of the pantograph with the overhead catenary. Of course, there's also weird pantographs like on Zurich's S10 line, which are off to the side. You can check out that video if you want to learn more about why that is. These wires themselves are actually also typically held under tension, either by weights and pulleys or by spring-loaded devices. This allows smooth and firm contact between the train itself and the overhead wires. But this also helps keep the wires tensioned as they expand and contract in the heat and the cold. Now, you may have seen that some overhead wire systems, such as trams, don't have any visible tensioning. And this is okay because usually the tensioning in such systems is provided by a trolley pull, or more likely a pantograph, and slower speeds are used. One interesting thing to note about catenary wires is that they're meant to oscillate back and forth as you travel down the track, which is something you'll notice if you look at a POV video of a train traveling down a track with overhead wire. This is because pantographs work with a long insert in them, and the wire moves back and forth to distribute the wear from the friction and contact across that insert. If you were to have the wire stay perfectly centered on the pantograph, it would wear a groove in it and the insert would wear down way faster. So where is overhead power used? Well, a better question might be where it isn't used. From high-speed rail to freight to regional trains to trams to metros, overhead wire is used extensively on all kinds of different rail transport. Its flexibility is also super useful because it's easier to use it on systems that kind of change their operating mode. For example, going from a tram to a subway to somewhere in between. That's especially true because through rail is basically completely avoided on new builds where there are any kind of grade crossings or interaction with traffic, for obvious reasons. Though that isn't to say that third rail doesn't have its uses. Both technologies have upsides and downsides. One big benefit of third rail is just how low profile it can be. This aids in making for smaller tunnels, especially for metro systems, but it also makes it less visually obtrusive, which is nice, since you don't have the gantries, portals, and pulls that you'll see with overhead wire and catenary. That said, quite broadly speaking, overhead wire is safer. That's because the risk of contacting a third rail when you're walking on the tracks in an emergency, when someone is trespassing, or when you have a worker on the tracks is just much, much higher. Overhead wire also brings big speed benefits. While third rail powered trains are usually limited to speeds that would be appropriate for regional trains at most, pantographs can work on high speed trains. And this is in large part because the room for a pantograph to move up and down as a train flies down the tracks at 300 plus kilometers per hour is much greater than it would be with a third rail shoe. It's also really important to maintain that contact when you're operating at say 25,000 volts AC, and even a slight gap between the pantograph and the overhead wire for just a short moment can cause incredibly damaging arcing. That means you could say that overhead wire is quite powerful. It can also accommodate higher voltages of DC power, with 1500 volts DC quite common, and even 3000 volts DC seen in places like Italy, where two wires will actually be paired up. As I sort of referred to before, AC power is basically universally used with overhead wires, for a bunch of physics reasons that I won't get into in this video, but that people may attempt to explain in the comments. AC power has a lot of benefits, like needing less substations and line side equipment than with DC, because you have less losses over distances. At the same time, since longer distance transmission lines in our electrical grids usually use AC power, this also allows for easier connections to the grid. It's also notable that some newer metro systems, especially those in, say, India, use AC power, just for standard urban metros. And this is something that people sometimes debate whether it's a good thing or a bad thing from an engineering point of view. Another commonly considered thing with overhead wire power or third rail power is how they perform in inclement weather. Overhead wire power, for example, typically performs better in freezing environments and the like. Though rail covers, bottom contact third rail, and even heating the third rail is a way of mitigating for this. At the same time, as some commenters on a previous version of this video mentioned, overhead line power can be a little more susceptible to things like trees and other debris if you have really windy weather, and so there are some potential disadvantages there. Including with just overheight vehicles, if you have a freight train that has a really tall load on it that just comes into your overhead wire territory, or if you have a truck at a level crossing that's exceedingly tall, there is a risk of hitting the overhead wire that you wouldn't see with third rail. Perhaps surprisingly, not all systems choose between these technologies, some actually use both. 
Thameslink, London's first RER-esque through-running regional railway, is actually one of those systems. To the north of London, the system operates on overhead wires, and to the south of it, it operates on third rail. If you actually go to some of the city center stations, you can see the pantograph being raised or lowered to change modes from third rail to pantograph power. Staying in the UK, did you know that the old Eurostar trains are actually the only third rail powered high speed trains? Indeed, they were actually fitted as dual mode trains that could operate on the conventional Southern British network, which is electrified with third rail power and needed to be used before high speed one opened in the mid 2000s. The kind of changeover seen on Thameslink can also be seen on some metro lines, such as the Blue Line in Boston, which runs with third rail for part of its route and overhead wire for another. Another interesting case study that's been brought up to me in the past is of Chinese metro lines which may use third rail when they're underground, but when they come out to their depot, which is typically on the surface, they'll use overhead wire power to be safer for workers working in the yard. At the same time, hybrids between third rail and overhead catenary do exist. For example, the Madrid and Barcelona metros, which I talked about in a previous video, actually extensively use what's known as rigid catenary, which is essentially a third rail with a wire embedded in it that's mounted like a third rail. And this allows the pantograph to be really tight to the roof of the train, allowing for really tight clearances. It also requires less equipment for things like tensioning, because it's essentially a third rail. Believe it or not, there are also third rail powered trams. Using a technology known as Alstom's APS, trams in cities like Bordeaux, Dubai, and Sydney can operate with a central power rail. Now you might be wondering how this is safe, but the technology is smart. The power rail is only energized when a tram is directly over it. So the tram is essentially operating above a moving third rail, which is pretty cool. Though that being said, it doesn't work in places where you have, you know, snow. So sorry, Toronto, you can't have it. To close off, it's worth mentioning that we even have buses which can operate on overhead wire, which I talked about a bit more in my trolley bus video. As you can probably see, the choice for how to power your transit, be it with third rail or overhead wire, isn't quite so simple. And some really good systems swear by one or the other. For example, in Singapore, make sure to subscribe to our video on that system soon, actually swears by third rail. All of their new lines use it, and only one of their lines has ever used overhead wire. Understanding the potential benefits and drawbacks of different forms of electrification is a great way to be more engaged in the planning process for your local transit system. But it can also help us advocate for more electric transit and less polluted air. So with that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.